pray that you would just prepare us to receive it um, and uh, apply it in our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Greg. And uh, it's great to see you all today. Welcome. Uh, last Sunday, our elders were here and provided an update about senior pastor succession. Uh, if you missed that, we have that online and uh, also was sent to you by email. Maybe you didn't check it this week, but I'd uh, like to catch you up there. If you weren't, were not here last week, I don't have time to go over it all today. Uh, but this has been a process that we started two years ago that I initiated, and um, our, our next steps are coming soon now. And we know that this could take up to 18 to 24 months, so elders have asked you to begin praying as we go through this process for wisdom and discernment and for uh, our next senior pastor as well. We are looking forward to that. We are in a healthy season in our church, and we are excited about what God has in the next season uh, for our ministry on this corner. So continue to pray. Uh, we have lots of opportunities and open doors that God has given to us. And that leads me into this is the normal time when I bring you a financial update to the church. And I can tell you that uh, I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, we are actually ahead of budget right now which doesn't mean we don't have 100 opportunities to spend that money, but we're, we're, uh, we're not. Um, and we are being able to fully minister as we had planned. And uh, we have some things coming up that we are knowing that we have to save some money for, but uh, we are just excited about what God has done in and through this congregation. And uh, you have received a letter probably within the last couple weeks uh, from our staff uh, a thank you note for your participation in giving in this church. If you're a regular giver, you would have gotten one of those. Now, our staff doesn't know what you give, but they were just given a name to thank you. Um, I hate to use the word full-time ministry. Um, I'm a vocational minister. Um, I have a full-time ministry in this vocation in this church. You have a full-time ministry where God has put you vocationally as well. We're all in full-time ministry. But this is your paid staff who wrote that, and I hope uh, I told them they should be thankful that you are generous to our body so that they can help serve the body in their vocation as well. So that's why you got that. Well, as Greg said, we are in the final lap of our journey. It's interesting. I was talking to my brother this week down in Nebraska he did a foolish thing a little while ago. He took a road trip with his son and daughter-in-law and their two children, a 15-hour road trip one way. He said, yeah, that was tough. And he said, I didn't realize as I've gotten older how selfish I am and how noisy kids can be. Now, so, so those of you that have young kids, uh, God bless you as you take those road trips. What are the most common words you heard on a road trip with uh, young people. Are we there yet? Or how much longer? And I say this isn't just confined to the old now, uh, uh, young now. It's also confined to the old now because I find when I get in a car on a road trip, I'm looking at the GPS and going, where's the next rest stop? Um, you know, can I make it to the next rest stop? You know, so I'm kind of starting to ask those same questions. You know, what goes around comes around. But just as Greg said, we are here today. Revelation 21 and 22 will be our final message here. So congratulations to all of you who have taken this journey with us. And I trust that it has strengthened your faith and built your foundations and given you a greater hope in the gospel and in what God has for you in the future as well. And as this book was written, it was written for your endurance in the midst of living in Babylon, midst of living in, in a place that is evil and marred and broken. And you are encouraged to live faithfully and holy in this particular system. This is why this book was written. So we have started from the beginning these letters to the churches that remind us what it means to be victorious in our faith and the promises that come with that. And then we saw this vision where Jesus opens this scroll. It's the inheritance of the earth, that which he created 
which was marred in the fall, he now takes back this inheritance. And with it, you and I are a part of that inheritance. And we saw how in all of these different visions, how God is making a way for Jesus to reign uncontested. And that's where we ended last week with, um, with sin and death and all who are participating in that were judged. No longer a contestant. Jesus will reign uncontested. Today, the last two chapters, or the last chapter and a half really, open up to us what it looks like in that eternal reign. So we are going to move to a cosmic eternal place today of what that reign looks like after Jesus, in essence, judges all who have stand opposed to him. What's that gonna look like for you and I? It's what we call heaven. It's what we call paradise. It's what we call, as we're gonna see in just a few minutes, heaven and earth joining together. What does that all look like? Now, many of you have never thought much about heaven, honestly. As a matter of fact, most, I find that most Christians are excited about heaven as a concept. They just don't want to go there today. And maybe that's you. I have encountered this many times. I think a part of it is our wrong concept of heaven and our own desires and this and a, a kind of a shallow understanding of heaven. I think a lot of us think of heaven like this picture. Oh, they got it up on the big one. <laughs> I think a lot of us think about that. I was thinking about this. Greg didn't know that was actually coming, but um, I was thinking that maybe only Lindsay would think this is heaven. <laughs> but a lot of us have a shell of you like they're, oh man, heaven is boring. I don't even play the harp. And by the way, angels don't have wings. In case you don't know that, they don't have wings. Cherubim do, seraphim do, but angels don't. That wasn't in my sermon. But <laughs> riding on a cloud that heaven's some kind of boring, boring place. And so today, John ends by giving us a vision that is supposed to increase our desires and our thirst. In the free church, we call this imminency that we're to believe and live as if Jesus comes today and it's called to move us towards holy living and energetic mission. That we're meant to see heaven for what it is and allow it to motivate us for holy living and energetic mission. So I want to take a look at this cosmic future, this eternal state today, which we sometimes call heaven or paradise and then ask ourselves a few questions of it. So take your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 8 is going to, 1 to 10 is going to be our text, but the first three verses actually contain uh, the point. So I'm going to read this from the pulpit. You can follow along in the text uh, on the screen as well. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Those first three verses form the context of the rest of these chapters. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or going to the dermatologist to get your face fixed. For the old order of things have passed away. So this past week, I got the joy of going to the dermatologist and my wife was sitting across the table from me and she counted 14 spots that he burned off my face, precancerous things, and then I got a biopsy as well. There was a total of 17 things he did. I walked out of there like my brain was frozen, you know? And uh, just think, the old order of things is going to pass away. Uh, my dermatologist is becoming a friend now. Um, so he who sat on the throne, verse 5 says, I'm making everything new. Underline that in your text. That governs this whole passage, that Jesus is making everything new. The, <clears throat> then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. So it takes us back to the first seven letters that we read of our inheritance here who, who are victorious. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which we saw last week. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. You remember when we taught through chapter 17, this same angel identified this way, introduced to us the great harlot Babylon, the cities infused by evil. And now he introduces another woman, the bride. And he carried me away in the spirit, verse 10 says, to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So this Jesus is saying at the end, I am making everything new. You can't imagine. It's new in quality, not new in time. This is the word for quality. I'm making everything new. You can't imagine how much better things are than what you've experienced up till this point in your life. We're going to see all sorts of news in this passage that I'm going to call betters. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, new relationship with God for those who are redeemed, a new environment for man, new eternal dwellings, a new temple, new light, and new living conditions all the way around. So today I want to take a look at those first three verses and let that inform the rest of our chapters here, a chapter here. The three expectations that you and I can have as we look at the eternal state of what's going to be so much better. Number one, a better heaven and a better earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now you'll remember that whenever we see then I saw that we know a vision is coming and it's moving us farther into the story. So we're moving to the last part of the story, the eternal state. And John pictures in this vision, heaven and earth joining together. It's an amazing description because the old had passed away. So everything you knew about the old earth where we're sitting today is gone and a new heaven and a new earth come together. And there's no sea. Now we've seen throughout our work in the book of Revelation that the sea is kind of a metaphor for separation or sinful actions, chaos. Uh, John is on the island of Patmos, separated by the sea from everything that he loved and cared about. And then it reminds us that a new heaven and a new earth are going to come together. So in the scripture, there are three heavens that we have identified. It's, it's an interesting thought. The first heaven is the atmosphere that you and I live in. I think that would take us up to the breaking the space barrier. The second heavens defined in the scripture is the, where the firmament is, the stars and the sun and the moon and all of the galaxies that you and I know about. That's the second heaven. Then interestingly enough, there's a third heaven. And in our passage, uh, Uranus is the word here and it kind of comes from a god or the, one of the planets, uh, Uranus. Uh, is the actual Greek word, and it's the word for heaven here. There's a third heaven, and that would have been understood by the people who read this as the abode of God. In the Greek world, it would have been the abode of the gods, but for the Christian, it was the abode of God, and it's defined for us in scriptures. It's interesting how we view these, this word, which can be termed as paradise or heaven, or a new heaven and a new earth because it has tenses to it in a lot of ways. In, in this particular passage, we're going to continually be reminded of the Garden of Eden, of how we, you and I in Genesis 1 and 2 were created in the image of God to be in the presence of God in this place called the Garden that he created. 
And then chapter three comes of Genesis and that man fell away from this great place that God had for him and his creation in presence with them. And so we have this garden, that was past tense, paradise. We're talking about that. Chapter 22 is gonna take us back in imagery to paradise. But interestingly enough, Jesus also talked about it in the present tense. When he was hanging on the cross with the thief, and the thief had responded to him and believed in him, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus believed that paradise was not just a place in the past, but also a place that he could invite someone to and have fellowship to after they died. That's exactly what it means. Paul, when he would talk about this, he said that God took me up to a place called paradise, a third heaven, and there I saw things unimaginable, things that I knew a guy, I can't even speak about it. He actually talks about this part in his letter in 2 Corinthians. He talks about it as, um, I know this guy. And this guy got whipped up into heaven and saw things that we, I can't even talk about. I don't even have language for. Which is what's happening to John as well. As he gets taken away to a mountain and he gets to see this and he gets to see this experience it reminded me as I was studying that this week that um, years ago, I, I loved a guy by the name of Dr. Hugh Ross. I've lost track with him now. But he talked about the dimensions of time and space, how you and I live in three-dimensional, but we actually live in four, height, depth, width, and time, those four dimensions. But that scientists have identified like 11 dimensions of time and space. So what would it look like if you, three-dimensional, went down to two-dimensional, two-dimensional, Mr. and Mrs. Flat, two-dimensional on a piece of paper? Do they have as much understanding of the world as you do in three dimensions? No, but what if you went from four to six, or six to eight, or eight to 11? What would that be like for you to see? And God gives us little glimpses of that, and I think that's what he does here as well. The first heaven and earth destroyed because it's been Satan's dwelling place and everything that reminds us of that sinful, broken, fallen world, it says, will pass away. Isaiah 65, 17 says that he creates, and it's really where this passage comes from, he creates a new heaven and earth and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Shall not be remembered or even come to mind. It will pass away. Hebrews chapter one, verses 10 to 12 says this. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you will remain the same and your years will never end. So we have this picture of the new heaven and a new earth. And conceptually, it's, it's a stretch for us to even think about it. How heaven and earth, and I think John means this issue of the third heaven, coming down to earth and joining and being the place, the garden that God created to be. Interestingly enough, scientists have worked, thought about this, and they said if there was no sea, and the scriptures tell us that the mountains will flee during this time and be flattened out, and all of that ground would be eight times as much fertile ground as you and I have to work with right now. And we don't know what that means or what that looks like, but it's an interesting thought. Secondly, we see a better city. And I saw the holy city, verse one, verse two says, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Verse four, he will wipe every tear from her eyes there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new. He says, you write this down because it's trustworthy and true. This is something you can bank on, Jesus says. It's interesting because the holy city that comes down from heaven does not seem to be part of the creation or recreation that God does with the new heaven and new earth. It was actually prepared in heaven. 
This is actually just an interesting thought or however you want to think about it. It was prepared in heaven. And it is equivalent, the bride and the new Jerusalem, the holy city are the same. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. We don't understand the full ramifications of that statement and probably never will until we die. But this is the new Jerusalem and these are taken right out of prophecies in the Old Testament. Isaiah 62, verse five, first five verses talk about that Jerusalem will be the bride married to God. This is the image that was always given to Israel and reiterated two times in this passage in verse 10 as well. And verse 11, 12 show us that this city now reflects the full glory of God. We are prepared by means of the Holy Spirit. We're prepared in such a way that um, when we are cleansed and regenerated, we are prepared as, in essence, a bride, his child. But in that day, we will see, we will reflect the full glory of God. We don't do that fully now. Well, I don't either. <laughs> You're speaking for this crowd, are you? <laughs> Shut up, Siri. <laughs> How they just listen to everything. Huh? Should scare all of us. All right. <laughs> so this city, this bride, will reflect the full glory of God. And it's in contrast to the cities of this world that have always been infused by evil and who do not reflect the glory of God. Now, starting in verse 11 of chapter 21, in essence, John takes us on a virtual tour of this holy city, which he said is this massive cube that actually covers all of God's new heaven and new earth. This cube is representative of the cube that is found in the holy of holies, the most holy place of the, of the Jewish tab, uh, temple, where God's presence was meant to meet with the, his people and the high priest once a year. And so I just want you to think about this. You'll have to read this later, but literally every precious stone and metal is used in this to reflect the glory of it and the glory of the bride and how it reflects God's glory in everything that it does. There's 12 different kinds of precious stones in here that are part of this, this new heaven and new earth, this holy city. And they, they're also a reflection of the ephod, of the, the high priest's ephod that he wore going into the Holy of Holies to meet God that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. This, this particular passage describes the 12 apostles that are foundational to the church. And so it's a reminder of the Old Testament and how God brought the Messiah. It's a reminder of, of the New Testament church as well, that we're all the church of God from every tribe and nation and, and tongue in the world. And it's a reminder to us that, um, that we will reflect the full presence of God. Now, in here, we get some of our singing about the heaven and all that sort of stuff. And there are reiterated in here, streets of gold. What I want to just bring out to this, and it's just beyond words in human capacity, what this will be like for us. But I had this thought this last week that said something like this, everything you and I hold precious and dear and think have great value are used as construction materials in the new heaven and new new earth. What you and I think of as asphalt, God thinks of streets of gold. You and I hold on to that stuff thinking it's of value, and God says the great value is in the person who has committed their life to me. The bride is my value. The bride is my value. That should increase desire for us when it comes to heaven. That should increase desire for us when it comes to anticipation about what he has for us. So this is a better city than any other city we've ever seen, any other beautiful city you've ever seen. Now, one of the ways you can look at this passage to kind of get a bigger breadth of it is what's here and what's not here. So let me take a look because we read that scripture of what's not here. There's no sea. We talked about that. 
There's no death. Your, your anticipation and desires should grow as you hear these things. You'll never, ever have to stand at the open grave of a loved one again. There's no death. Is that good? That should increase your desire, your hunger for God, he says. That's why he's writing this. There's no curse. Do you know that every relationship that you have is marred by the curse? Every relationship we had, every have is conflicted. Every one. There'll be no curse. Verse 8 reminds us of the non-character of Jesus. All of these sinful actions. He says, none of that will be in this place. Those are the things that cause relational issues, aren't they? None of that will be in this place. Chapter 22, verse 5 says, we'll read a little later, but just to highlight it, there'll be no night. Huh. We often associate the night with uh, kind of things that happen that shouldn't, right? There'll be no night. There'll be no need for light because he himself will be our light. There's no temple because the bride is the temple. The bride is where the, the glory rests and is seen. There'll be no mourning, no crying, no pain. Like I said, the old order of things is gone. Everything that has caused us pain. The old order causes us pain on every, every level. Every level. And Jesus says, increase your desires because I am making everything new. Let's think about your prayer requests and what's causing you pain right now. The hurt, the mourning, all that sort of stuff in our lives. The evil around us that pushes us. All of these things. It won't be there in this city. Then we see the third, in the third verse, chapter 21, we're going to have a better worship. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. This is a game changer. He will dwell with them. There will be no separations. There will be no temple curtains. There will be no marred earth, no brokenness that separates us from understanding and knowing God as you and I were designed to know God. Because there's no temple. There, there's no tabernacle. You know that tabernacle was when Israel first started out. They made a tent to where the ark was put in the, the place where they would meet God in the Holy of Holies. It was a tent. It was movable. The same word that Jesus used when he came down, he says, I'm going to tabernacle for a little while in the flesh among them. But there's coming a day when there won't be any need for separation anymore. Verse 6 says, it's done. We saw that last week. And he reminds us who he is. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. This inheritance that God has shown us that Jesus Christ takes in the scroll. He's saying now, for those of you who stand firm, who commit your life to Christ, this is your inheritance. This is what you have to look forward to. It is glorious beyond compare, he says. I will be their God and they will be my children. You know, we get just little touches of this here and now. And even this week, I'm praying for a, just a little touch of that in our congregation as we go out into our neighborhoods. I'm praying that you'll bring a little bit of anticipation, that you'll bring a little bit of paradise and a little bit of heaven to your neck of the woods. And I'm praying that it's going to be hard for people in your neck of woods to go to hell because you care about them. Because you're going to stretch out and you're going to love them and care about them and create a relationship and you're going to pray for them and invite them as Jesus invites all of us to come to him and be fully satisfied, to have our thirst quenched fully because that's what he desires to do in our hearts and lives. Revelation 21, verses 22 to 27 reiterates this. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord Almighty, the Lamb, are its temple. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, 
And the lamb is its lamp holder, its light holder. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor to it. So remember, God is creating a family out of every tribe, tongue, nation on the earth. And now he's saying without that evil, without Babylon, without the evil system now, all of these nations will be productive before God and bring splendor to him, to glorify him as we were all created to do. And on no day will its gates ever be shut. This is interesting. We saw a picture back there about the gates. Um, I didn't talk about it, but each gate that represents the tribes of Israel, 12 of them, will all be one pearl. Think about the big gates and how big this cube was, uh, 144 cubes. It's, it's an amazing coverage. He says that, that those gates will never be closed because you'll never want to leave. And the Bible says no one who ever has put their hand up to God and said, I don't want anything to do with you, you won't want to be there because the holiness of Jesus will be there. And this scripture passage, actually we're not going to talk much about the scripture, says those who are vile will keep getting even worse and those who are righteous will keep getting any better. That is the glory of the choice you make for heaven that there will be a continual growing in righteousness and what it means. I, I just don't think just because you and I will be face to face without the temple, and that's a scripture we'll see in a minute, I just don't think that we'll learn it all in the first 30 seconds of the depth of who God is, that this will be uh, something that you will continue to grow in as you serve God in eternity. So then chapter 22, verses 1 to 5, takes us back to the garden again. Takes us back to the garden. Then an angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. You're in the, you're in the garden now. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. You're in the garden now, remember bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding this fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the lamp of a lamp, the light of a lamp, or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. I hope your desires increase because what's being shown here is a society where all the splendor that has brought and created the, a society of great creativity and productivity to the glory of God as it was intended, not as it happened in Genesis 3 when the fall of man happened. And notice what it says here in verse 4, they will see his face. This is a reflection of, of um, Moses when he came before God in Exodus 32 and 33. People rebellious before God. God tired of it. And Moses cries out to him, don't kill the people, show me your face. And God says, you can't handle my face. It'll kill you because you're unrighteous. And it says that God put, in essence, his hand over Moses and he allowed him to see his back. That's what you and I get to see now. We see through the glass a little dimly now when it comes to what God desires us to know of him in his presence. And we're, we're marred by our own sinfulness. All these characteristics that we see that keep us out of heaven, you and I have all experienced those. It's who we are. But here we see that you can eat and drink the tree of life and the river of life. You can be whole and healing. These resurrected bodies won't need tune-ups anymore. The, the, the leaves of this tree will be a continuous healing for us. And we will see his face. We will be able to see him face to face. This is the glory of this. And I hope that as we think about these things, it increases our anticipation and our desire. And John ends this way. He says there's a couple things that need to, that have implications when you think about the glory of this eternal state. Number one, 
we need to start living like it could be today. Seven times in the next couple of verses, Jesus reminds us, or words are written, that it's soon happening and that I'm coming soon. Seven times. He wants you to live today like he could come today. And he tells us that we will be blessed if we live this way and keep his commandments. This was a church that was being persecuted, that was asked to turn away from God and to worship, in essence, the gods of Rome and the emperor. And they were being persecuted for it and killed for it. And he said, you stand firm to the end and you'll be blessed if you do. As a matter of fact, in chapter two, after this blessing is reiterated, verses 18 and 19, he says, if you don't stand firm, you won't get to eat of the tree of life. He's telling the church to stand firm in the midst of Babylon. Yeah, it's evil. It's broken around here. That you stand firm in the midst of Babylon. Live holy and godly lives. Five times in these verses from six to the end of chapter 22, he reminds us that holy living is who we are called to be in this society. To live holy and righteous. I think it also has a second implication for us. Is that knowing the glory of of what we're called to, of paradise and heaven. And knowing the agony of being apart from that for those who remain in their sin ought to motivate us, as our doctrinal statement says, to energetic mission. That each one of us should be concerned for the people we love and care about, that they would know the power and presence of God in their own lives. And we would be willing to share the words of good news with them. Because when you see throughout this whole book has been this contrast of life and death. And he wants us to understand that you and I as people, understanding the presence of God in our own life in this broken and marred body, that we're to give the very good news message of Jesus Christ to everybody we care about. Verse 14 says, blessed are those who wash the robes, who remain holy in the midst of this city. They will have the right to the tree of life and they will go into the gates of the city. It says, outside are those who practice all the evil things, verse 15 says. Once again, the picture is painted for us that there is an outside and there is an inside. And we as part of our anticipation, if you know the goodness of what God has planned for you, and, and Scripture tells us, I has, we just can't see all of that yet. We have no idea what God has planned for us, but we, we know a bit. And we should desire that for every person that we come in contact with. Verse 17 ends with this great invite. The spirit and the bride says, come and let the one who hears come, let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. Three invitations here. You hear it? You go, I want that. He says, come. You can be fully satisfied. You're thirsty. This life is, you know it's broken and it's left you kind of empty left you thirsty for something better. And he says, you come, drink. Drink of the water of life. I'll I'll fill you. I'll satisfy you. Whoever will, you come. You see, there's a third garden in the scripture that you and I all have to say and understand. We got a picture of the Garden of Eden, how it was meant to be and how it turned to broken and marred and fallen. And then we get a picture of eternal grace and what it means for us who put our faith and trust in Christ and what that could be like an eternal state of paradise. But there is a second garden that we are celebrating this week in Holy Week. That without that garden, none of us would experience this garden. It's the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus humbled himself 
and took and said yes to God to go to the cross and take our sin there. Because of that garden, you and I can experience this garden. Let this garden drive you so that everyone will experience this garden. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for painting this picture that just isn't fully clear to any of us, but it gives us a great hope in life that you have something beyond our imagination, something we couldn't even imagine, planned for us, and we give you praise for that this day. Lord, as we leave this place, may our hearts be full of anticipation and joy because of the hope you give us. May our hearts be also burdened for those who don't know you. And may we allow those two things to work together to live holy and righteous before you. Let me just say, if there's any of you here today and you heard the description and maybe you'll desire that, I want you just to say yes to Jesus. Don't be on the outside of this. Jesus wants all men to come to the knowledge of truth with him. He says, whoever will come to me, I will give you this kind of life and satisfaction. Just cry out to him right where you are. He knows you. Thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness to us. Guide and direct us as we leave this place today.